The U.S. Catholic bishop slammed American immigration policy at their spring meeting in Florida. Why are they wading into this debate? And why are some considering canonical penalties for Border Patrol agents? First thing, senior editor Matthew Schmitz is here with analysis. The U.S.-North Korean nuclear summit went off without a hitch last week. How will the region be affected? Asia expert and president of the Population Research Institute, Stephen Mosier, will tell us. And finally, Father's Day is coming, and we'll look at the deep bond between kids and their dads. Pediatrician and author of You've Got This, Unleashing the Hero Dad Within, Dr. Meg Meeker shares her insights. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Stephen Mosier, Matthew Schmitz, and Dr. Meg Meeker are all straight ahead, plus a world over exclusive on the latest developments in the Archbishop Fulton Sheen saga, that battle over his remains. We'll share that with you in a moment. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout. And now, some news from the world over. The Australian bishops are holding firm against a new law that, in effect, would require priests to break the seal of confession. The law, passed by the legislative body for the capital city of Canberra, stipulates that all religious organizations must report any child abuse allegations, offenses, or known convictions within 30 days. This would include anything disclosed during the Sacrament of Reconciliation. President of the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference, Archbishop Mark Coleridge, noted the Church's objection to the new law. Now, the Church doesn't want to protect criminals. It wants children to be safe from them. And the Church wants measures that really will make environments safer for children. But there's nothing to suggest that legal abolition of the seal will help in that regard. Whatever about questions of religious freedom or the sheer practicability of what's proposed, the real question is, will it make children any safer? And the Church's answer is no. And on Monday, Pope Francis accepted the resignation of Chilean Bishop Juan Barros. Barros was at the center of the Pope's and Chile's growing clerical abuse scandal ever since Francis appointed him bishop in Orsono in 2015. He did so over the objections of local faithful, his own sex abuse prevention advisors, and some of Chile's other bishops. He even came to Barros' defense in spite of allegations made by victims during his visit to Chile earlier this year. Barros had been a top lieutenant of Chile's most notorious predator priest and, according to victims, was a witness to the abuse. Barros has denied the charge. And the cause for the canonization of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen is a step closer as the battle over his body seems to be coming to a close. The New York Supreme Court has ruled that the body of Archbishop Sheen must be removed from the crypt of St. Patrick's Cathedral to Peoria, Illinois, to hasten his cause for sainthood. The years-long legal battle between the late televangelist's niece, Joan Sheen Cunningham, and the Archdiocese of New York has delayed the cause. According to the canonical process, the remains of the deceased should rest in the diocese petitioning Rome for sainthood. Peoria picked up the cause after New York refused to do so. The world over has just learned that attorneys for Joan Sheen Cunningham have presented the Archdiocese of New York with a permit for disinterment and would like to see Sheen's remains removed within a week. Now, there has been much confusion about this case. In his will, Sheen wanted to be buried at Calvary Cemetery, the priest cemetery in New York. When Sheen died, Cardinal Cook got permission from Joan Cunningham to bury him at St. Patrick's Cathedral. The family always has a say in interment. Now, Joan Cunningham wants Sheen brought home to Peoria, as his desire was always to be a saint. This will facilitate the advancement of the cause. 
We will keep following this story. It's an important one, and hopefully this will be the end of the legal dispute. Here now to discuss the U.S. Bishop's stance on immigration policy from this week's spring meeting, as well as a few other important stories, is senior editor at First Things, Matthew Schmitz. Matt, welcome to the program. He joins us from New York. Thanks for having me on. Controversy erupted this week, Matt, over the detention of illegal alien children in the U.S. Uh, at the U.S.-Mexican border. And the U.S. bishops at their spring meeting in Florida began their proceedings with a condemnation of U.S. policy, particularly as regards asylum policy. USCCB President Cardinal Daniel DiNardo issued a statement read by his general secretary. Here's a taste. We urge courts and policymakers to respect and enhance, not erode, the potential of our asylum system to preserve and protect the right to life. Additionally, I join Bishop Joe Vasquez, chairman of the USCCB's Committee on Migration, in condemning the continued use of family separation at the U.S.-Mexico border as an implementation of the administration's zero tolerance policy. Give me your reaction to that. And again, I think the bishops may be conflating two things here. One, asylum policy, which is narrowing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the other is longstanding American law connected to the Flores decision, which demands that children be separated from their parents and they be housed in a facility in the United States and then released into the country. Your take, Matt. Right. So the first thing we should say is no one wants to separate children from their parents. Right. And if asylum seekers present themselves at one of the ports of entry in the country, rates of separation are much lower. So we're talking about people who have crossed the border illegally. They're being charged uh, with a crime and the children are being taken from them. The government is trying to connect them with their families. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, the solution to this is going to be reducing that flow of illegal traffic across the border. That's what's mm -hmm. going to prevents the separation of children from their parents. Yeah. They seem to be elevating uh, this issue, the issue of, of immigration, and making it part of the life issues. It's, it's a return to the old, uh, you know, uh, Joe Bernadine seamless garment uh, vision for the church. Is this legitimate in your mind? No, it's not. Uh, in my view, abortion is a unique evil. It is per se wrong to kill the life of an innocent unborn uh, child. Uh, immigration is different. Every nation has to have borders. It has to attend to national security. These are principles that our bishops have repeatedly affirmed. Um, I think the bishops are very sensitive to the fact that they're leading a church that's increasingly Hispanic. Uh, Catholics under 30 are majority Hispanic. However, uh, Zogby did a poll in 2016 showing that 58 percent of Hispanics in America favored Trump's immigration policies. Many of them said that they did not like Trump personally, but they favored his policies. Furthermore, 78 percent of Hispanics in America oppose increased immigration. So there's a lot of nuance to these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things we're not hearing is there's been a 625 percent increase in the number of family units and unaccompanied minors at the border since last April. So they're trying to respond to that. But it should be said there's a Flores decision. You can look it up. I think it goes back to 1997. And that requires when an unaccompanied minor comes here or even a family unit that the child be taken and put in. They can't be kept for more than 20 days, but they have to be kept in a facility and then released into the United States. Now, that loophole is being exploited now. There's a lot of people gaming the system, and they're saying, well, I'm not going to get in line. I'm not going to apply for citizenship. I'm going to go this route and just throw my kid over the border. There's something to be said, and the bishops, it's a shame they're not saying it, about the, the evil of a system that incentivizes family disunity and family rupture. I mean, it's, it's pitiful what they're going through in these, in these countries in South and Central America. I understand that. But to incentivize them to come here and, and throw their children over the border seems, uh, you know, a, a, a wrong that should be righted as well. And I think there's, a, there's certainly a lot of emphasis right, here I in D.C. on fixing that law. Go ahead. Right. Every, I think everyone wants to have a humane approach and avoid these situations where children are being separated from their parents question is how to how to reduce that. Now, the majority of asylum seekers we have coming over the U.S.-Mexico border 
are not from Mexico. Right. They're from Central American countries like, like Guatemala, Honduras. Mm -hmm. Now, Colombia. the under international law, the first place they should seek asylum is, you know, is their country of direct entry, the first country that mm -hmm. they enter into. Um, so, you know, we need, we need to be in discussion with the authorities in Mexico uh, to see if some of these people can receive asylum there. And above all, we need to reduce incentives that are uh, causing mm -hmm. people to make moves that are dangerous, you know, dangerously moving right. across borders, uh, putting their lives in the hands of traffickers. Yeah, and the, and the traffickers uh, are gaming the system, trying to pass people off as asylum seekers or as asylum, uh, you know, r respectable and, and serious asylum seekers. And the, the, the Justice Department at the same time is trying to clamp down on some of those loopholes. So the other day, Attorney General Sessions said, we're not going to grant asylum for people who are uh, s uh, fleeing gang violence or domestic abuse. That's something that needs to be handled in the home country. The bishops are lashing them over that. I want to go on. I want your reaction to this. A little later in the spring meeting, Cardinal Joseph Tobin of Newark had the suggestion, and it, it sparked a lot of discussion, about sending a delegation of bishops to the border. Listen. I'm just going to make one suggestion now. And that is that this assembly delegate or mission a group of bishops to go to the border and inspect, to the best of our ability, the detention facilities where the children are being kept as a sign of our pastoral concern and our <gasps> protest. Matt, your reaction to uh, the bishops going down and appointing themselves to basically inspect detention facilities in the U.S.? The bishops should be attentive to the concerns of their flock. Um, I'm glad for the intentions of the bishops, but I think it's important to bring some nuance here. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Hispanic Americans, Hispanic Catholics are law-abiding citizens. They want the laws of our land to be followed. They do not support illegal immigration. I think it would be a mistake for the church to speak in a way that suggested that defending the border uh, is per se immoral. Um, you know, if we're interested in addressing the practical solution on the ground. I think we're going to have to talk about thing, you know, the, the practical situation on the ground. We're going to have to talk about practical solutions. Mm -hmm. If we're interested in grandstanding, uh, we'll have a lot of high-flown rhetoric uh, instead mm -hmm. of trying to hammer out a workable political compromise. Well, I think, look, the bishops have their heart in the right place. They want to ensure that families stay together. They've long protected, and the church should help people new to this country. Uh, uh, that, that's absolutely essential and a part of the church's long-standing social mission. Uh, the question is, should it be getting involved in the nuances and delicate nature of public policy disputes? Uh, the biggest bombshell came during the migrant discussion. It came amid the talk of family separation, and it was an intervention by the Bishop of Tucson, Arizona, Edward Weisenberg. He offered this. In light of the canonical penalties that are there for life issues, I'm simply asking the question if perhaps our Canonical Affairs Committee could give recommendations, at least to those of us who are border bishops, on the possibility of canonical penalties for Catholics who are involved in this. I think the time is there for prophetic statement. I also think, even though what I'm saying may be a little risky or dangerous, I think it's important to point out that canonical penalties are there in place to heal, first and foremost to heal, and therefore, for the salvation of these people's souls, maybe it's time for us to look at canonical penalties. Basically, what he's calling for are canonical penalties for Catholic Border Patrol and ICE agents who are enforcing existing U.S. law. Your reaction, Matt? The first thing I would say, today, in the year 2018, the majority of Border Control officers are Hispanic Americans. They're patriotic Americans, Many of them are Catholic. Many of them are the children of immigrants. Uh, some of them are immigrants themselves. So when we're talking about canonical penalties for border control agents, we are talking about border penalties, excuse me, for Hispanics. Mm. Um, so there, there may not be an awareness of that um, among the bishops, but that should be kept in mind. These are 10 out of 11 uh, current recruits for the border control agency. Mm -hmm are Hispanic Americans. Yeah. So we, we, need, we need to have a sense that you know, they're not attempting to be cruel, to be inhumane. 
Uh, these are people who are native Spanish speakers, many of them, mm -hmm. uh, fluent Spanish speakers, and they're trying to address the situation humanely. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's I got the a, main thing I would say. I saw a titanic backlash against this the other day when I talked about it uh, in other media, and uh, I got letters and or emails rather from Border Patrol agents' families, and as you said, these are legal immigrants who came into the country. Two of them that I heard from were veterans on top of it, and then they became Border Patrol agents. And they're like, wait a minute, so I'm going to be denied communion for enforcing the law of the land and protecting my country? I think the bishops are on a very kind of delicate, as the bishop said there, dangerous and risky slope here. And uh, we'll see where this ends up. Matt, I want to move on to other issues. Uh, Pope Francis this week challenged energy and oil executives to act on climate change. Three years ago, you'll remember his Laudato Si, the environmental and cyclical, uh, called for us all to be aware of creation and particularly drew our attention to climate change, which has been a priority for his pontificate. Now, he says they have to find other sources of energy and move beyond fossil fuels. How do you think this is playing? Well, I think the main reason that hasn't happened is that it's not very practically possible. Uh, Germany, a country that's very much committed to these goals, uh, was unable to meet its 2020 targets for reducing carbon emissions. So there's there are just practical issues going on here. Mm. And furthermore, I'd say a lot of people mistrust this rhetoric about climate change because, you know, it's like with environmental rhetoric. They think that there are bureaucrats somewhere that, you know, want everyone to kind of, you know, shut off their air conditioner mm -hmm or uh, make it harder for farmers to go about their life or, or make it so that coal miners are unemployed. But mm -hmm. they're not sure that those bureaucrats have their interests at heart. Mm -hmm. So the, the main way to uh, move these issues forward, I think, would be to have a political leadership that people believe actually speaks for them and cares about their issues. And that's what we haven't had across the West for a long time. Mm -hmm. Also in the news this week, uh, Catholic hospitals in Ireland are about to be forced to offer abortion services. This follows, of course, that referendum to liberalize abortion laws in Ireland. Uh, and whereas individuals can opt out of participation in abortions, the institution cannot. Are we seeing the end of Catholic health care in Ireland? We are indeed. Uh, any institution that will call itself Catholic must refuse uh, these orders, or else drop the name Catholic. Uh, there's no other option. Um, you know, it's nothing. Nothing could be worse than taking the life of an unborn innocent child, but to do it in the name of Christ and His Church uh, mm. is unthinkable. What a pity, Catholic Ireland. Matt Schmitz, thank you so much for being here, and you can follow Matt's commentary at FirstThings.com. Of course, the great flagship created by our friend Father Richard John Newhouse. Thank you for being here again, Matt. Stephen Mosier is up next, but first, a little more news to share with you. The summit of the century is in the books, with much promise for a future peace, but so far, few details. U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met for several hours on Tuesday in Singapore, and by most accounts, their high-stakes interaction was cordial and productive. They concluded by signing a joint declaration. In the broadest strokes, Kim has committed to begin a denuclearization process. In return, Trump has offered security to the dynastic regime and an end to joint military exercises between the U.S. and South Korea. Trump declared the summit a success and said via Twitter that America and the world can sleep well tonight. There is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. As for an actual timetable of the continued talks, U.S. and North Korean officials will resume meetings in the coming days to hash out details of a disarmament deal. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who has made multiple visits to the leaders of South Korea, Japan and China, said denuclearizing the peninsula is sure to be a complex and contentious process, but the U.S. was hopeful that North Korea would make major disarmament steps before the end of Trump's first term in office. And a quick note on the president's top economic advisor and a friend of this program, Larry Kudlow. After suffering from what the White House described as a very mild heart attack on Monday, Kudlow has been released from the hospital here at Walter Reed, and he is resting at home. 
His recovery is going well, according to doctors. There is no timetable yet for when he'll return to the White House, but it's expected to be soon. Our prayers are with Larry for a full and speedy recovery. Joining us now from Florida to discuss all of this and more is the president of the Population Research Institute and author of the book, Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Please welcome Stephen Mosher. Steve, we watched this summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, obviously historic. Now, some say Kim Jong-un got the better deal. What is your take? <laughs> I, think, I think Kim Jong-un uh, got, got the shock of his life when he had to start dealing with President Trump a year and a half ago, because President Trump talked to Kim Jong-un in the way that no one has ever talked to the emperor of North Korea. Remember, this, this young man grew up in a cosseted, coddled environment where everyone was bowing and scraping to him as the next comer in the Kim dynasty. And here you have President Trump talking to him, calling him Little Rocket Man, uh, threatening fire and fury. Uh, these are things that got his attention. You know, communication is very important. Mm. And, and when Kim's interpreters translated these things for Kim, I think he set up and take, took notice. Secondly, mm. President Trump put Kim Jong-un in a box. Now, with the sanctions, right? Now, right. now, China tried to help him out of the box by cheating on the sanctions last year. We caught him transporting goods across the Dandong uh, Bridge into North Korea. We caught him again a few months ago transferring goods at sea from Chinese ships to North Korean ships. So now the sanctions are really in place. They're really hurting. And, and Kim Jong-un knows there's only one way out of the box, mm. and that is by heading south, by, by repairing relations with South Korea, with the United mm. States, with Japan, and with, with North Korea's neighbors. And finally, President Trump, and this is important, he got Kim Jong-un alone in a room with nothing but the translators present. Yeah. The Chinese desperately wanted to be there. They wanted to, quote, unquote, mediate, mm. right? Now we have an agreement. They want to be the guarantor of the agreement. They want to come in and do the inspections of the nuclear weapons and the mm. missile facilities. Uh, they want to be a part of this. We should keep them out of it. Mm. Uh, we saw a master negotiator at work, and I think for the first time in 65 years, we now have the prospect of peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Trump tweeted something out upon landing in Washington following the summit. This was it. He said, just landed a long trip, but everybody can now feel much safer than the day I took office. There is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. Meeting with Kim Jong-un was, was interesting and very positive experience. North Korea has great potential for the future. Is that overly optimistic, Stephen Mosher? I mean, the North Koreans have given us no timeline. We don't know when they'll denuclearize. What say you? Well, I think, I think we do have a timeline. I think that uh, the, the, the master builder, uh, Donald Trump, knows that uh, signing a contract is only the first step. I mean, we've signed agreements with North Korea before, right? Mm -hmm. And while President Clinton was waiving his agreement with North Korea to denuclearize, uh, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's father, was busily turning that contract into, uh, into uh, kindling for his latest Korean barbecue. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we have a real agreement. Uh, I think we have, according to the Secretary of State, we have a two and a half year timetable mm -hmm. for denuclearization. We have teams that are ready to go into North Korea and look at the missile sites, look at the nuclear sites, and verify that we are getting irreversible, verifiable denuclearization of North Korea. So, yeah, I think we're on track to make this happen. Uh, no contract is valid in the, in the minds of President Trump unless it contains a timetable. There was, a, there was a lot of criticism of President Trump following the summit, uh, many saying human rights were not the focus of the summit and weren't brought up enough. At the news conference on Tuesday after meeting with Kim Jong-un, the president had this to say about that topic. Watch. Christians, yes, uh, we are brought it up very strongly. You know, Franklin Graham spent spent and spends a tremendous amount of time in North Korea. He's got it very close to his heart. Uh, it did come up and things will be happening. Should human rights have been a bigger focus of this summit, Stephen Mosher, at this point in the opening dialogue? Now, I think in the opening dialogue, you deal with the immediate uh, existential threat to the United States, to South Korea and Japan. You deal with the nuclear weapons and the missiles that are capable of launching them. 
But what we want is a more open society in North Korea. And what we saw President Trump do was get Kim Jong-un alone in a room and show him a vision, give him a vision of what North Korea could be. North Korea could look like Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, look like mm -hmm. Hong Kong, look like Taiwan, look like countries that are developed, that are prosperous, mm -hmm. and where you don't have 15 percent of your population in brutal labor camps, where you don't mm -hmm. put up a wall around your country and pretend you're a hermit kingdom separate from the rest of the world. So I think if the opening begins, it has a natural impetus of its own. It will pick up momentum over time and, and the kinds of persecution uh, of Christians that we see will, will gradually end. It won't happen overnight, yeah. but the release of the three uh, Korean-American missionaries is a good step. Mm. Stephen, give us a sense, and we've, we have some numbers from Open Doors, which is a religious freedom watchdog group. Uh, they claim that there are about 50,000 Christians currently being held in prison or under house, house arrest, in labor camps. Uh, what kind of pressure needs to be exerted for the North to end this? And why is Kim Jong-un continuing in the pattern of his father and grandfather? Why are they so allergic to Christians? Well, I think they're allergic to Christians because the, the religion of North Korea is, is a worship of the Kim dynasty, which means mm -hmm. going back to the grandfather Kim Il-sung uh, and Kim Jong-il and now uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, the the North Korea, North Koreans are supposed to be worshipful of the emperor. Uh, they're supposed to be members of the Workers' Party, or at least mm -hmm. respectful of the, the communist dictatorship that rules China. And in that ideology, there is no room for mm -hmm. competing ide de ideologies. Uh, in that ideology, there is no room for, for worship of God or anything outside of North Korea itself. I want to get back to the, the, the focus of the summit, which really was denuclearization and bringing peace to the region. Um, th there have been a lot of reports in the North Korean media that uh, focusing on the concessions the president gave. Um, do you have any confidence that Kim won't just drag his feet and prolong the conversation while he continues to build up his nuclear reserves? Well, that's always a possibility, Raymond, but, but what we have here is a fundamentally different approach than we've seen in the past. Uh, in the past, we, we, we saw bad behavior on the part of North Korea, and we tried to reward them into stopping the bad behavior. Now, every parent alive knows mm -hmm. that you don't reward bad behavior, because if you do, you get more, more of it. bad behavior. So what you do is you punish bad behavior, as we're punishing North Korea with, with sanctions, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and that punishment, those sanctions will continue in place until and unless we see denuclearization. And, and for the first time, the sanctions are really hitting the North Korean elite. You see, I don't think Kim Jong-un cares a whit about the masses of the people. They're not real to him. Mm -hmm. But what is real to him are the effects on his immediate family, on his supporters, the few thousand elite families in Pyongyang who have their own cars, who have mm -hmm. the latest... Uh, computer network uh, access and so forth, those people are being hurt by the sanctions. They can't buy gas for their cars. Mm. Uh, the electricity goes out when they're in the middle of watching the latest Hollywood movie. So they don't like these sanctions and they want them removed. And if they don't get them removed, I think there'll be a lot of pressure on Kim Jong-un and he may eventually be removed himself. So the, the, I think finally Pentagon... we're in a position where we can, we can look for the Koreans. Mm -hmm. Both South Korea and the Pentagon were sort of shocked by the announcement that uh, we would cease military drills with South Korea. Now, do you expect, uh, we've heard from Pompeo that this is contingent upon the North bargaining in good faith. And if that, if that good faith bargaining stops, those joint exercises will resume. A good concession? Yeah, I, I, I have a little concern about that myself. I have four sons in the military, uh, including one who is in Iraq right now. And constant military training exercises are necessary to keep your fighting force in fighting trim, especially when you're dealing with two different armies, right? Mm -hmm. the, North, the South Korean Army and the American Army. They need to carry out joint exercises. But temporary, a temporary cessation in the exercises while we negotiate a firm timetable, it seems to me to be a reasonable thing to, to, to do. And, and of course, we're getting, finally, uh, our soldiers missing in action in the Korean War, mm. who've been 
Uh, their families have been, 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 been hoping that they could be returned from North Korea for proper burial in the, in the United States for now for 65 years. That's Thank finally God. going to happen. Thank God. Uh, let's talk for a moment about China's role. You mentioned it earlier. They wanted to be part of this summit. The United States said, no, 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 you, you can't be. We'll take care of this. What does China want out of this deal, this peace deal? They are, as you've written about, the regime in North Korea's primary backer. They are their primary source of income and their largest trading partner. Well, let, let's, let's look first at the past, right, where we had six party talks. We had China at the table. We had Russia at the table, South Korea. Everybody was at the table and nothing got done, right? The larger the committee, usually the less amount of work gets done. So now we have a one-on-one -on -one and we're seeing real progress. China has been cut out of the loop. Now, it's important that China stay out of the loop, in my opinion. We need to, to wean North Korea away from dependency on China. That's exactly the opposite of what China wants to happen here. China wants to keep its North Korean ally poor and dependent upon China. Remember, this is China's only ally in the world. This is the only country, North Korea, that China has a mutual security treaty with. And, and China regards North Korea as, as a vassal state, as a protectorate. Chairman Mao once said, uh, North Korea are the lips and China is the teeth. Mm. And if the lips are gone, the teeth will get cold. Mm. So if we manage to move North Korea out of China's orbit, even a little bit, then China is exposed to what? It's exposed to, uh, to, to the world of uh, North Korean pros prosperity, the world of North Korean development, the world of, of an end of North Korea's dependency upon China. That's a big loss for China. I want to play this for you. This is Mike Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State, at a press conference on Thursday. This is after he met with Japan, South Korea, and China regarding those sanctions on North Korea. Watch. We also talked at some length about the sanctions. Uh, China has reaffirmed its commitment uh, to honoring the U.N. Security Council resolutions. Uh, th those have mechanisms for relief contained in them, and we agreed that at the appropriate time, uh, that those those would be considered, but but we have made very clear uh, that the sanctions and the economic relief uh, that North Korea will receive will only happen after the full denuclearization, the complete denuclearization of North Korea. Can we trust the Chinese to continue imposing those sanctions, Stephen Mosher? Well, I think the Chinese know that we're watching. I mean, we've caught them twice cheating on the sanctions. Uh, we've caused them to lose face. Uh, Xi Jinping, I think, is finally playing ball when it comes to the sanctions. He tried it on land. He tried it at sea. I mean, what is he going to do? Uh, the equivalent of the Berlin airlift of 1948, you know, flying goods into Pyongyang. We'll catch him doing that, too, if he tries it. So I think the sanctions regime is in place. And, and I cheer at the fact that it's going to stay in place. Those pun that punishment is going to continue to be inflicted on the Kim regime until he gets rid of his nuclear weapons. That's the way it, it should have been done 30 years ago. That's the way it's finally being done now. And you have to give the great disruptor, this businessman who came into office with the idea of actually getting things done, credit for this. Now, whether he gets the Nobel Peace Prize or not doesn't matter. He will have brought peace to an important part of the world. What do you foresee here in the coming days? The president himself has said this is the beginning of a process. How do you see the process playing out? And where do you think it will end? Is this going to be East and West Berlin coming together? Is this going to mean the, the ending of the DMZ and the, and the state of war that continues? Well, it, it has to start with the end of the state of war. I mean, we, we have to be moving very, very rapidly, I think, to a peace treaty between the United States and North Korea, which are still technically at war, despite the armistice that was signed in 1953. We have to get the million-man army, North Korean army, away from its forward deployed positions on the demilitarized zone. We have to move back troops on the south side of the demilitarized zone as well to, to, to stop any sort of accidental confrontation. Mm. And then we have to be identifying all the troublesome sites in North Korea, the biological weapon sites, the chemical weapon sites, and the nuclear weapon sites, and send American inspection teams, not Chinese teams, not the International Atomic Agency. They've been unreliable in Iran. Mm. We have to send American inspection teams in to make sure that things are truly dismantled, that weapons are truly 
uh, taken out of the country, properly disposed of, mm -hmm. and then we can move forward with eliminating the sanctions. What happens at the end of the day, and I think that that day is a long way off, I think eventually as East Germany uh, collapsed and joined West Germany, I think we'll, we will eventually see North Korea, the regime there, collapse and, and join South Korea. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's not going to happen overnight. That's, that's going to be a long process. Very good. Stephen Mosier, thank you for being here. Stephen's book, Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order, is available at bookstores and online. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. My next guest has spent over 30 years practicing pediatric and adolescent medicine and counseling teens and their parents. For Father's Day, she's here to discuss the crucial relationship between fathers and their kids. Her latest You've Got This, Unleashing the Hero Dad Within is out in paperback. Please welcome back to the program Dr. Meg Meeker. She joins us from Michigan via satellite. Meg, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Raymond. Now tell me, there is this negative stereotype of dads that persist in the culture at large and I think get in the heads of a lot of dads. Why does that continue, given what we're seeing in society, where in the African-American community, 70 percent of, of children have no dads at home? In the, in the white and Latino communities, 45 percent uh, are, are dadless homes. Why does this negative stereotype persist, and what happens to the kids left behind? Well, I think that's a great question. I think the stereotype of dads being sort of bumbling idiots who really aren't necessary in homes has been building over the past 20 years. And I think there are a lot of different re reasons for it. I think that the women's movement that started in the 1970s began all of that sort of saying, we're the ones that are important. Moms are the ones that are important. Dads aren't really necessary. And then media jumped on board and Hollywood realized, well, we can make a lot of money off of making the dads the butt of everyone's joke. Mm. joke. So it just kind of spiraled from there. And I think that as a pediatrician, one of the things that disturbs me the most about it is that I see firsthand the devastating effects on kids when they don't have either a dad engaged or a dad at home because the research is crystal clear that kids who have a dad in the home or very engaged in their lives, not a perfect dad, but a good enough dad, mm -hmm. do so much better in life. They, they, they finish high school, they go on to college, they have a higher self-esteem, they test better on tests, mm -hmm. less likely to be depressed, have anxiety, you name it. So it's a really important issue that I really think we need to address, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do with You've Got mm -hmm. This. Now, tell me, what is the big mistake dads make when they don't ask themselves, how do my kids see me? Why is that an important question? You pose it in the book. Well, yeah, it's very important because I think that pretty universally dads devalue their importance in their kids' lives. Dads very typically say to me something like this, you know, I really want to be a better dad, but I know I'm failing. And I think that it's very common for dads to see themselves as not doing a very good job. You know, I work with the NFL. I work with all sorts of dads mm -hmm. across the country. And I'd say the number one problem is that dads really don't see themselves through their kids' eyes, which is you are critical to my development. You, dad, are the center of my world. Most dads don't know that and they don't feel like that. Mm. Why are, and tell me in what ways, are dads important to girls and then to their sons? What, what, are the, you know, dads, what do they look for? What, what do each sex look for from their dad? That's a great question. Dads play a very different role in a daughter's life and a son's life. We'll look at boys first. Mm -hmm. You know, boys are very visual people, and in order to grow up to be a good man, they need to see a good man in action. And a lot of men grow up and literally don't know how to act as a dad because they've never seen that. It's critically important for a boy to move into manhood 
by seeing a dad and feeling that he's valuable in his dad's mm -hmm. eyes. You know, a boy can feel good in his mom's eyes, and it's great. You can be a great mom to a son and do a really great job. Mm -hmm. But there's something about that father figure that makes a son feel very important and ve very valued as a man. A daughter, on the other hand, needs to... Um, re learn how to relate to men through her dad. She learns what it's like to be treated as a valuable woman. She watches how her dad treats her mother or other women, and she learns how her father treats her. And she grow up. She grows up to expect good behavior from a boyfriend or her father if she's grown up with a father who treats her well. What's the secret? about kids that dads often miss. You mentioned this secret, what is it? Yeah, I, I think the secret that dads often miss is that what kids really want in life and what really shapes their identity and great character is time with mom and dad. And I think that dads are so quick to sort of sign their kids up for soccer or football or dance or whatever, mm -hmm. believing that their kids will grow into great people as long as they have enough experiences outside of the home. But that's entirely untrue. Kids have told me over 30 years that what really makes them great people and changes who they become as adults is face-to-face -face time with their dads and their mothers, particularly their dads. You know, dads often feel, I think, um, uncomfortable and unsure, particularly in this Me Too moment. What would you advise dads? I mean, you know, it's as if masculinity has suddenly become toxic, and even the things normally wired into us to attract those of the opposite sex, uh, you know, are now somehow verboten. Uh, what do you tell dads? What do you instruct them in this particular moment that we find ourselves in? Well, I think it's really important for dads to push back against the anti-male sentiment. And it's real, it's strong, and it's gaining momentum. You know, I think the Me Too movement has really been hijacked. And there's a lot of anti-dad, anti-male, really male bashing out there, which really is devastating to young girls because girls grow up not trusting men, disliking men, and that's really confusing for girls because they desperately want to trust their dads, mm. to stay connected to their dads, to be loved by their dads. Mm. But if they grow up feeling, and, and, and men can't buy into this, that men aren't to be trusted, that's devastating to kids. So dads need to push back and they need to feel comfortable with their masculine identity and engage it. Don't be ashamed of it. Be proud of it. Be present. And, you know, trust your instincts as a dad. You really can't go too far wrong if you keep doing that. I, I want to shift gears a little bit. We've been seeing a lot of, in the news certainly, of high-profile suicides. Uh, Kate Spade, mm. Anthony Bourdain. Uh, suicide is rising at an alarming rate. Uh, I read a study the other day where we're seeing a 25% increase in suicide. Why? Meg Meeker, and are you seeing this in the young as well? You know, I am, and I don't know if we've talked this about this before because you have done, you and I have done a number of things together, but anxiety in kids is rising in frequency and it's occurring in younger and younger kids. The same is true with depression. And mm. I think there are a lot of factors, but primarily remember, Depression in kids is about a sense of self-hatred, and kids learn to hate themselves when they feel unloved, when nobody spends any time with them, and when they feel very isolated, it, it, when mm. they live, if you will, in their own world. And yeah. with technology and screens, kids don't live engaged with their family and present. They live very isolated and disconnected, even though they can be in the same house. So. Yeah isolation, loneliness, sadness, feeling like they're not valued or loved is mm -hmm. really what drives a lot of depression in kids. Do you recommend banning devices in the bedrooms to keep everybody in public areas and in the den and in the family room? Oh, absolutely. You know, parents should know, even parents of 18-year-olds, 
should should know what their kids are looking at, what they're doing, how much time they're spending on devices. And I think a lot of parents feel overwhelmed and they think there's no way I can know what my kids are doing. But you know you can. Mm -hmm. You've got to scan what your kids are looking at and what you're doing. And actually, I think spouses should do that. You know, you mm -hmm. don't live with secrets in your home. That's what makes a great marriage and that's what makes great parent-daughter and parent-son relationships is mm -hmm. everything's in the open, there's accountability, and you really mm -hmm. can help protect your kids and even teenagers need to be protected from themselves and what comes across devices. What would be your final bit of advice, not for dads, but for those around dad, for moms and the kids to make that man a better dad? Change the way you talk to the man or the father in your life. You know, men need respect to be great men and great fathers. And I think that women fall down over and over, and I found this with myself, by talking down to men, criticizing them. So turn that. Speak up to men, respect men, be polite to men. If you do that as a wife in your home, you're teaching your children to do that as well. Dads get better and the whole family gets stronger. Hmm. And, and what are dads missing in your estimation as you watch them? What are they not doing that they should be doing in family life, both to their, to their sons and their daughters, or with their sons and their daughters? I think, it's real, I think it's really simple, Raymond. I think they need to show up and they need to be present. Mm -hmm. they, when they walk in their homes at night after a day of work, turn off your cell phones. Understand your kids are reading you constantly for information about how you see them. If you look them in the eye, if you talk to them, if you listen to them, if you engage them, even 10 minutes more a day, your relationship with your child will, will improve 180% for mm. sure. Dr. Meg Meeker, you're always great. Thanks for being here. Come see us again. You've Got This, Unleashing the Hero Dad Within by Dr. Meg Meeker is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. That is all the time we have for now until next week. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And a happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. And be sure to join us next week. Newt Gingrich is here for his perspective on what's happening in the world and here in America. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.